When someone brings up the topic of poor or laughable localization, what do you think of? Chances are at least one of your immediate thoughts is the now defunct company for kids. A lot of people would consider them the epitome of bad localization. And while that is certainly something I agree with, that they will always be the shining example to point to. However, a lot of the core issues found in those localization jobs are still present to this day, just far more subtle in their execution. Now, I know the first counter to this claim would be bringing up examples of several companies that have very good localization practices in the modern day. But to that I say there always was. The point back then was never that 4Kids was the standard, it was just how shockingly bad it was for something in the mainstream, taking on such big properties as One Piece and Pokemon, to name a few. But again, at that time, we can point to other companies who did handle localization more faithfully. Let's establish, while I do disagree with the choices 4Kids made, there is a semblance of sense to it. It's in the name. It's a licensing company aimed at only children. They were in the business of children's entertainment, not bringing anime to a western audience. They were completely shameless in their disregard for the author's original intent, just taking these properties and Americanizing them for said audience. That's not an excuse for these weird amalgamations they created, but it is important to understand the reasoning and to put into perspective how things haven't exactly changed for the better in some respects. As I said, 4Kids, while mainstream, was targeting that one demographic. It was never the powerhouse of the industry. So, that being said, who is? I would argue, when it comes to localization, two of the most recognizable names are Crunchyroll and Funimation, both having their hands not only in anime adaptions, but video games and other various merchandising as well. Not to mention, unlike 4Kids, they aren't selling themselves as an Americanization. They very much are in the business of anime, supposedly. In fact, a lot of their employees will tell you they are the business. And oftentimes, there are cases of them shaming individuals for not supporting the company. It's clear they view themselves as the anime industry and want others to hold them in this regard. So let's look into both these companies and how they are choosing to localize properties. While we will be discussing a lot of examples, I want to start with the most infamous scene that you've most likely heard about. That's 2017's Dragon Maid. In episode 12 of the original sub, the character Lukoa, when asked about her outfit, says this. <laughs> Funimation chose to localize it as such. Oh, those pesky patriarchal societal demands were getting on my nerves. So I changed clothes. Give it a week, they'll be begging you to change back. Huh? Now, I'm starting here because while this is infamous, I never see people go into why this is such a bad change. There's more to it than what you see at a glance. Localization isn't about matching word for word everything. Lines will always be different, but they should do their absolute best to carry the same meaning. Let me explain. Immediately, the issue here is the joke has been completely reversed. Instead of it being that everyone was telling her to tone down the sexuality, and to her responding, well, your body's loot on its own. The localizer made it so she's blaming the patriarchy, implying she had an issue with being sexualized, society and all that. This does not fit the character at all. The entire purpose of Luoko's existence is to just molest a little boy. That is her character. She is the Ara Ara trope to a T, and sure, she's great at it. But point being, the Shotokan molester is probably not the one who's going to give you a lecture about the patriarchy, and have an issue with the sexualization she so willingly presents. That's why the original joke works. She was designed to be a sexual character. The localizer just randomly found a scene to insert their own politics, without care for the character or the work, simply using them as a mouthpiece. It's insulting. Let's go to another example. In interviews with Monster Girls, when the vampire girl Hikari confronts a school bully, the Funimation dub sneaks in the line. You some kind of social justice warrior? Now this line obviously doesn't match the original dialogue, and it makes no sense why this character would speak with this language. But even past that, it's a terrible use of localization. Anyone not in the know is going to be confused by it, and anyone who is in the know is going to associate so much political baggage that the word is immediately immersion breaking. There was no need for this. Again, it simply removed the proper line and replaced it with a political jab. 
It's much like another infamous instance in prison school, where the character uses the phrase, You gotta stick up your ass, or are you one of those dumbass Gamergate creep shows? <laughs> then you jump forward to My First Girlfriend is a Gal, and you start hearing stuff like this. Inside of my, my, ugh, what the hell is this? I, I can't read the sick misogynistic crap. Oh, come on, they're just some light novels. They may be light novels, but they're heavy on the creepy sex stuff. Mm. Of course, where's the fun in forcing these jailbait tricks to read something decent? Plus, most of the freaks who come in here hate women, so seeing girls degraded gives them boners and makes them happy. Well, maybe think about how these girls feel for once. Maybe they don't want to be debased just so you can sell a few more <laughs> chicken wings to horny losers with mommy issues. Check out the balls on this kid. Come in here and lecture me, you dickless cuck. Book day's been canceled, you guys. Another win for you SJW millennials. With this scene, the main target audience of the anime has been smeared as women-hating, misogynist freaks, as well as inserting terms like cuck and again, SJW. That's a big step up from the self-depreciating humor the show already had. That's not to say it's a problem when anime decides to laugh at the market itself. Plenty do. It's that none of this was in the show to begin with. The whole point of the scene in the sub was about the discomfort of the girls, as well as the reason why the customers would like this sort of thing. In fact, that's the commentary itself. The show explains why this scene exists in the first place right there. Yet the dub explicitly makes it mean-spirited, slandering erotic light novel readers. It never ends, honestly. There are shows that are coming out literally today as I am voicing this script, still proudly flaunting how they changed a completely innocuous scene, to include a character stating, Hey bitches and bros and non-binary hoes! These choices aren't done at the service of the show, the characters, anything to do with the work. In fact, it even contradicts it at times. The only purpose of these changes is to slip in their own stances, boast how progressive they are, and they take jabs at their opposition, or their own audience in some cases. That's the key difference here, as we go in to talk about more of this. To reiterate, this is not defense, but with four kids, there was something inherently charming about the child-friendly Americanizations of the shows handed to them. We still joke about the yeah. One Piece rap, the Shadow Realm, Jelly-filled Donuts. There's so many countless examples, we probably all have our favorites. Cares if he's richer than me, and so what if he's more powerful? I'm really good at playing card games, and that's what life is really all about, anyway. Take it easy, boss. You got the blood vessel. Who cares? I'll just buy a new one. As unnecessary as these are, what makes them endearing in a sense is there's nothing necessarily malicious about them. Four kids' changes were usually playful, absolutely absurd, and brought about by nothing but a desire to make the shows what they deemed more accessible for a younger Western demographic. Whereas people like the Funimation translators use others' work as a vehicle to express their seething bitterness toward the ghosts of Gamergate, while mocking those that take issue. Mind you, these modern changes are not just political. So let's get into another more subtle aspect. Now, much like the last section, there's new examples every season of horrible localization changes done to both subs and dubs. Oftentimes, they're unnecessary and will frequently cause the work to age awfully, such as the addition of social distancing lines to Love is War. Or others can just be the toning down of topics that the translator finds disagreeable, such as Mion's mother's sexual comments toward Kaichi in Higurashi. However, to really dive into my point about these unnecessary changes, I want to take a look at a recent example in Higurashi Go. Above all else, what immediately caught me off guard, and other viewers as well, would be the translation of Nini. contained in the sub release. In this context, Onichan is how you would pronounce Big Brother in Japanese. The phrase Nini does not have any translation, as obviously, it's a cute nickname based around the pronunciation of the word. Traditionally in Higurashi, this is something kept as such because there is no translation. It's seen similarly to other cute noises the characters make. But if you were to do a translation, at least from my perspective, you take the concept, whether it's shortening Big Brother to Big Bro, or being even more identical, keeping the repetition, something like Bro Bro. Even saying that, though, I don't think either of those are a good substitute, which is again why it's typically not touched, but the choice the localizer went with in this case was Big Bruder. Even though Sadako was never speaking with a childish lisp, and translating it this way does not come with the same meaning as a cute nickname, yet this is what we're left with. 
This might not seem like a big deal at first, and you might just chalk it up to a bad choice by the localizer, but what came from the situation is far more telling. This was not a popular choice at all. Nini was something memorable, so changing it was always going to come with backlash. When the criticism began pouring out online, the translator took to Twitter to tell everyone she made the correct call. How this choice was better than the work of old. A lot of her justification, though, was based on the fact that her little brothers would struggle saying her name, and when explaining her process of talking to her peers for how they would translate it. It was very jokey and quirky, they bring up phrases like big chungus or having her say big shitter instead of sister. Obviously I know these were not serious contenders, right? But it's the fact that this process, these changes, seem simply done to change, to inject a personal quirk above all else, into a piece of media that isn't theirs. And to repeat, they went after something considered memorable by the community, seemingly purposefully to cause friction. This has never been changed in any official release in the Higurashi series, before and even the dub that came after didn't screw this up. I can't speak for everyone, but the consensus online seemed to be similar. It took me right out of several scenes that should have emotional weight. This clearly wasn't done to help the script in any way. It had the opposite effect. A lot of localizers seem to be willing to sacrifice the integrity of a story or aspects of a character just to put that little personal, this is my thing now, touch. In fact, if we look over at Crunchyroll, limiting ourselves to finding an identical situation even, we will see yet another example in Princess Connect. The newest Ganchi game Crunchyroll has localized. When the character Mimi says Onichan, this is clearly audible. Onichan. But what we get in text is Mr. Nice Guy. That is just awful. Sometimes in translation, Mr. is chosen instead of Big Brother, because while we typically see Onichan as the word for Big Brother, it's not strictly used for sibling relation. Onisama, Onisan, and Nichan all technically mean older brother as well, but can have different connotations. So in this case, the simplest way to explain the context is to say Onichan is used endearingly toward older males. That is why depending on the situation, Mr. can be a decent substitute. Ultimately though, that endearing or warmness that comes with it is what's important. This translation changes that tone. It's unnecessary for the sake of being different and quirky. It's not even a case like Nini, where there is no translation to begin with. You have two options from the get-go. There seems to be a common belief that localization is about adding your own personal flair to a product, and in some cases it is even looked down on and even seen as boring if the adaption doesn't have a quirk to it. That is something I believe to be heavily misguided. And when this is argued against, some will often bring up how the alternative is a stiff translation, saying that changes need to be made for adaptions. These dismissals are willfully ignoring the nuance of the issue, and pretending people are asking for something they are not. This isn't black and white. Translating a work isn't simply choosing between 100% literal Google translation and fanfiction that is entirely divorced from the original text. At the end of the day, complete faithfulness is unobtainable but a translator's job should not be taking someone else's product and making it their own. They should, well, be translating it for others. I know some might say, but you just said Four Kids was endearing, which, yeah, that's missing the point though. They are still a joke if you view them as an actual translation. The entire process there is more comparable to an abridged series than an actual localization. But these modern companies aren't marketing themselves like Four Kids. This is sold to you as an actual adaption, yet has all of these creative choices, and I think that makes it worse. These end up being the equivalent of the old this is mine memes. They just take someone else's work and try to make it theirs. There will always be decisions that need to be made for the product, and who the localizer is will influence and inform said decisions. But those are choices made in service of the media, to give the best balance between fluidity and accuracy, not to serve oneself. Now, keeping with the theme of unnecessary, let's talk about the handling of honorifics. These are words meant to convey esteem, courtesy, or respect. Some examples in English would be your Mr. and Mrs. In Japanese, these would typically be your San, Kun, or Chan, to name the most basic few. A common controversy around these is that they shouldn't be kept in the localization process, a topic that's come up on this channel as far back as my second video, so it's safe to say it's not a conversation going away. But just like back then, 
there's a certain type of localizer that fully believes keeping them is indicative of a bad translation job in every instance, typically being seen as something that can be dropped without losing much meaning due to there being no direct translation, simply replacing it with the person's name as an example. One award-winning industry professional even excused it by saying the phrase, lost in translation exists for a reason, which he's correct in that it does exist for a reason, that to some extent we can never fully convert one language to the other. Nevertheless, that is not an excuse to just drop meaning and context from a word that's possible to preserve. When speaking of subtitles, the person seeking them out likely wants the most authentic experience possible, as opposed to viewing the dub, and chances are that pretty much every single person watching this format will either fall into one of two camps, already having a basic understanding of Japanese honorifics, or will be able to pick up on them quickly. Thus, removing honorifics and the additional context they provide does nothing to enhance the experience at all for the core audience. It's only a positive to have these things. Even an example where someone doesn't understand these additions, they are at least offered the chance to. In both situations, you're as far removed as the other, since you don't get the entire context. I'm not saying you always want to keep every instance. It is possible to preserve the same meaning in English depending on the situation, but it's not a bad thing to include this or anything else necessary to not lose meaning when it comes to text-based delivery. Right now, we currently have the perfect opportunity to see this in action with the show Redo of Healer, as the censored version of the show is officially released and subbed by High Dive, while there's an uncensored release being done with fan subs. There are many examples we can pull from, but for the sake of brevity, we will take a look at two. The first is from episode 10. Here, the protagonist, Kiryu, is disguised as a female in order to lure in one of the antagonists. Here's the official release. <laughs> And now the fan subs. What you lose out on is because our protagonist is tasked with acting as if he's nobility, the version of I he uses to refer to himself switches to the more formal use in Japanese. The line in the official release changes it to simply be about him pretending to be a woman. This is part of it, of course, but it is missing an important aspect. The way he speaks changes. Now, let's take a look at the second example from the sixth episode, when the character Norn is extorting the protagonist. This is the dialogue in the High Dive release. And now the fan sub. <laughs> Here what you're missing is half of the context once more. The word for an animal begging, such as a dog, is chinchin, -chin, which can also be a childish way of saying penis. Here you having to beg in this manner is an extra layer of humiliation. And the subtitles here allow you to understand the wordplay at work, but that aspect of the interaction is missing. The fan subs simply show that these words are the same in a completely unobtrusive way that will immediately click for the viewer. In both cases, these are simple additions that help you not lose the original context and don't really take away anything. Though it's important to point out, I did say text-based delivery earlier for a reason. If this was a dub, instead I'd find the removal to be understandable. It's only logical more leniency needs to be taken when translating a project completely into another audible language. You will lose some nuances. On top of all that, dubs are just a more casual experience. It makes sense to prioritize the dialogue sounding natural for that language and the sake of the product. But that's not what we're talking about here, is it? These are again, subtitles. It's very easy to keep these nuances intact for the dedicated fans seeking out this viewing experience. What I've given here are a few small examples from a fun anime I enjoy. Think about how much you can and have missed out on. The amount of little details, just from the localizations never showing this stuff. People like to poke fun at the translator notes of old, due to admittedly, some hilarious choices that would pop up over the years. But the core of it is something I sorely miss. I can't speak for everyone, but I don't see it as a bad thing that some of the culture gets left in a product. I enjoy learning these things when experiencing media. I don't want context stripped away when it's so easy to keep intact. Honestly, a little side note while we're on this topic. 
I'd like to point out that I find it strange how pretty much every single time what these professionals consider to be the right way to localize just so happens to always be the one that seems to require the least effort. This does not seem to be a trend by sheer coincidence. The localization industry doesn't even make any effort to hide that they aren't hiring based purely on who the most qualified localizer is. It's openly a den of nepotism and ideology purity testing. This near incestuous relationship isn't something that stops at anime or even games. That award-winning professional I brought up earlier is primarily a translator for folklore, which makes it so much worse. This is someone not only handling entertainment, but the culture directly, supposedly well-respected, yet he's telling you these people are correct in their actions. And to make it clear, it's not an issue of the politics in particular. My opinions on them are completely irrelevant. If we had them in reverse, and I was seeing words like chud mockingly show up in this media, instead of SJW, I would be cringing just as hard. That's not our reality though. You look at the people in these circles, working within this foreign media, they're saying stuff like anime is too white. Let's think about that. The most ironic part about this is we've gone over how it's these individuals removing culture from these products, adding Western terminology and Western politics in a lot of cases. To put it as they would, they're the ones whitewashing the medium. Even the funds that we see these companies take, Crunchyroll and its employees will insist they're the anime business, that the money you give them is going to help grow this hobby. But look at what they produce. Most famously is High Guardian Spice. The show was immediately sold to us on its diverse boardroom of strictly white women. Nothing to do with the content. Content, mind you, that has more in common with Steven Universe than anime from what we've seen. And the fact that the show is still missing in action just drives home the point that it wasn't developed enough. They just wanted to tell you, hey, look, we hired a bunch of white females. It's no different with so many of their other projects. They oftentimes will try to sell you on the progressive aspects of the work instead of the work itself. I don't even think that's a problem at the most basic level. If it's your product, do as you please. But if you're selling yourself as the anime industry, if you are asking me to give you my money as an anime fan, you know what I want my money to go to? Anime. Now, the real kicker is they did start this. At the tail end of 2020, a few manga they picked up were added to their original line. They just don't promote their actual anime shows to the same degree, but maybe there's a reason for that. Where are their eyes? <laughs> Let's not stop here though. Where else do the funds go that are supposedly supporting this industry? Because it's certainly not these adaptions. I did say Crunchyroll has their hands in games, so maybe let's look at that some more. There was the Don Machi game, where they censored the global release with the removal of the touching minigame, due to, and I quote, not as a matter of censorship, but being inappropriate for an English audience. Yet, they still kept it in the trailer, misleading many. Not a great look. It really does seem like you the consumer are always making compromises with this company, doesn't it? Hell, they didn't even have an HTML player for literal years until they were forced to change it with Flash dying. You know, let me tell you a story that you might know. Watamode was a series that largely gained its popularity due to the West. Obviously that series did get picked up, but there are always examples of this. I would love for Crunchyroll or any company to step in and get popular novel and manga series in the West, some money behind them for an adaptation, or even the same situation with games. But you saw what happens when they localize games. You saw what Crunchyroll adaptations look like. Even the non-anime ones they partner with Webtoons for largely failed due to those productions reviewing poorly and generally being considered rushed. This company, much like 4Kids, doesn't seem at all interested in supporting fans, the industry itself. Staying true to the creators, they're only concerned with their own vision. Now, this video isn't about Crunchyroll alone, or even strictly anime, though I've chosen to focus in these areas. It's important to understand this isn't isolated, so it's time we take a look at some video games, unrelated to the companies we've been discussing. If you want to encapsulate everything I've talked about up to this point, then look no further than Gunbolt, a game that originally released on the Nintendo 3DS and has had many re-releases at this point. One of the more interesting changes is despite this game being released in 2014, 
With the Steam Edition and onward, the localization was advertised as being more accurate. This is something typically reserved for the games released in the old days. You know, something that originally released in the 90s. Back then, games were seen as children's toys, and as such, the quality bar was much lower. We'd also see heavy censorship and changes as a result. Some of the worst cases were like Persona 1, where the entire race, character personalities were all changed, not to mention cut content. You'd imagine localization would be held to a higher standard now, yes? So in a modern circumstance, this must have been some small adjustments, right? Not comparable to the translations of old. Well, let's give a scene from the 3DS version a look. And now the Steam Edition. As you can see, the entirety of the dialogue in the scene is inaccurate. The character referred to as a bi-gendered individual and using they pronoun is completely made up, and even contradicts the sequel, as the character is confirmed to be a woman. This is no different than the situation with Persona 1, changing characters' identities, writing, and yes, cut content to a degree as well. To repeat, this was a game that came out in 2014. How is it acceptable that it was re-released with an accurate translation as a selling point? We should have been past this, but we still aren't. Stuff like this continues to pop up. The only thing that's changed from the olden days is the direction of how these games are altered is different. Not that it isn't being done. The biggest gaming company in the world, Nintendo, even suffers from this. I covered the infamous example of Fire Emblem Fates extensively in a previous video that you may check out if you like, so I won't be covering that here. However, for those not in the know, it was much like Gunvolt, flat out removing content and dialogue, rewriting characters, censorship, really the works. But to look elsewhere, and to show it's not something that just went away, we can look at Breath of the Wild as our example. One of Nintendo's biggest games this console generation. And it had lines inserted into it about destabilizing the market and capitalism. I trust that you picked up on the trend by now, that when it comes to injecting into a work, it's always this local random quirky dialogue, mixed with the exact same progressive political ideology. Now, of course, with this ideology on display, it eventually horseshoes into being offensive on its own. When me and Brad first met, I didn't think we'd get along, but turns out we kind of agree on everything. <laughs> My uh, favorite example of this, to step out of video games quickly, is the Saint Seiya adaptation on Netflix, where because the show wasn't progressive enough, they took the character Shun, who's a somewhat effeminate male, and turned him into a girl. I think that is notable, because it just shows how performative it all is. Shun was a unique character. His feminine traits were not only in his appearance, but his personality as well. That is representation. But the fact that these people looked at this character and said, oh, that's easy, just make him a girl, is both invalidating and boring. Now this character is just a generic girl. It's only ever about point scoring with this crowd. It only gets worse the more control these groups have on a particular product. Have you noticed that? And on the flip side of it, when it comes to removing content, it lines up in a similar way to what we saw earlier. We could go back to Nintendo. I could show you countless examples of dialogue and content changes in their games. Say, Xenoblade 2. Let's take an example where Poppy explaining how she is the result of three men's desires is quickly cut off by Zeke explaining why it's not good to say it like that. Obviously, the joke being the robot, Poppy, would not understand why giving a literal explanation would come off sexually. Instead, in the localization, it's just replaced with dry, nothing dialogue. And this is just one of so many occurrences in that game. Go back to Xenoblade X, and you had an entire customization option removed from your characters. Because women with big breasts so much as existing is sexual deviance, apparently. Even smaller stuff, like how in Animal Crossing New Horizons, you know the only version of this game, to have gendered language removed is the English version. And if you think I'm saying, that would be something I had a problem with in general, then you're still missing the point. If it was included in the game normally, it wouldn't matter, but it was a performative change made by the localizers, not the developers. 
Maybe it seems like I'm picking on Nintendo here. However, I think they're a great example of what the reality is for a lot of these companies. While Nintendo, as in the Japanese division, has been reiterating to fans and investors that they do not believe in censoring. On the other hand, the Western division continues to alter products. Perhaps the company's stances tie into why we've seen the changes become more sneaky than the flat removal of content, but they haven't gone away. It really goes back to what I said about the level of control. You just need to look at their competitor, Sony. Ever since their HQ moved to California and the company restructured with Jim Ryan as the new CEO, look what's happened. It doesn't stop at just the problematic aspects. They've begun letting go of large portions of their Japanese teams, stifling other studios from releasing products that don't align with their sensibilities. They're gutting this stuff. We've seen so many cases of censorship, the majority not even subtle stuff like dialogue changes, just blatant removal of content, leading to many series dying off or having to remove themselves from the platform. And this is all on top of the general hypocrisy of it. Sure, those weird Japanese games can show skin, but The Last of Us, you can have a disgustingly detailed full-on sex scene. Now, before we wrap up the talk about games, I think we should take a glance at the source of this, the people working on these localization teams. I could just show you a tweet from a localizer, such as Ben Bateman, a man who's worked on the Guilty Gear series, Mind Zero, Zero Escape, Aggress War, and so many more. Speaking proudly about how when he finds concepts presented in the medium, he does not approve of how happy he is to fix them. Actually, a very similar situation in the light novel world occurred recently, when the company Seven Seas issued several apologies for the heavy-handed localization changes in Mashoko Tensei, Classroom of the Elite, and I'm in love with a villainess. There's a lot to cover in this situation, to the point where near all the content is being re-released. So let's look at one example, and you'll get the gist. In Tensei, one of the scenes had the protagonist pull down his sleeping girl's shirt to politely cover her stomach, so she doesn't catch a cold. In the original scene, he takes the opportunity to grope said sleeping girl, thus changing the entire context of the scene. All of these changes are like this, removing content or rewriting characters, to make them act in a way the translator or editors find agreeable. That sounds a lot like another company, doesn't it? In fact, I'd even call that censorship. But those in the industry will always tell you censorship doesn't exist, because these groups always approve of it when it suits them. But in stark contrast, complain when it doesn't. Let's look at a rare example of that. Bokuten was originally taken down from Steam due to Valve stating the game had sexual depictions of an underage character. A localizer took to Twitter angry and fighting against said censorship, saying how Valve's actions were unjust. But he specifically made sure to point out that he was even more upset that he now had to fight alongside the anti-censorship crowd and how he wasn't like them because the normal stance coming out of his mouth like the rest of the localization industry was that censorship didn't exist yet censorship is suddenly a very real thing when it affects their wants funny that something on this i saw recently was one translator when talking about the process of localization brought attention to shadowverse a popular card game by Psy Games. He showed the art from the two versions, where in the global English release, the character had her body censored, and both are friends from earlier in the video, the Higurashi translator and the award-winning Folklore Localizer. Both gave replies saying how this definitely isn't censorship. It's simply localization for a Western audience. There it is again. That's what they always say, isn't it? How many times have you heard that excuse? And you know what? Maybe there's a point in there. These changes are for a Western audience, just a very specific Western audience. But that's not you. It's not me. It's not the Western fan base as a whole. These people make it very clear that they hate the community. But if you want to see how deeply embedded this behavior toward the fan base is, then we look once more back at Crunchyroll. This season, they began subbing the anime Please Don't Bully Me Nagatoro and a lot of people took issue with the character saying, sus, believing this was in relation to the recently popular Among Us memes. However, I was not of this belief. The word she uses is kyodoru, which is shorthand for suspicious. It would not be my choice, but by no means was it inaccurate. So I found the inclusion acceptable and even defended it. Oh, well, I read the original Nagatoro. Like the, the word that was there was shorthand for sus. I was like, this is fine. 
That was until I visited the translator's Twitter page, where they were reveling in the fact that this was pissing people off, that they had chosen this word distinctly with that intention. So even in a case like this, the translation wasn't translated for the sake of being the best, most accurate stand-in. It was again, some loser using someone else's work to attack its fans. It really is a common thing on these social platforms, seeing people in the localization industry, being at odds with the community, going as far to paint wide strokes, saying fans of anime or the gamers are racist, sexist, phobics, you name it. Let me just take a recent personal example once again. Genshin Impact is a game I spend a lot of time and even money in, but it's no secret to anybody who watches my streams that I despise near every aspect of the English localization. That could be a video on its own, honestly. But the particulars I want to focus on is a VA's treatment toward the fanbase. Paimon's English VA was semi-recently tagged in fan art on social media that they did not enjoy. Now, if that was the only issue, of course, and they were just making it known to never do that, I would see no problem here. I'd even agree with them. Not every VA is going to be comfortable with that. However, that was not the handling of the situation. The VA spun the entire ordeal into saying any fan that participates in producing or consuming art of Paimon that can be seen as lewd. Well, that makes that person a pedophile. They spent the rest of the day ranting about how this weird fairy creature was definitely a real underage child, how art of her is CP, and arguing with any fan that objected. Although the story doesn't end there. A week later, they went on an official live stream for the game, talking about how they were going to build a harem using a bunch of canonically underage characters. They even made sure to clarify that on Twitter after. I mean, me as well, but isn't this hypocrisy just so funny? that they can go on making sexual comments about these fictional characters. But not you. Don't you dare. Or you can expect to be slandered as possibly one of the worst things you can be. This also wasn't the only time they've come into friction with fans. There's a few other instances, but the one I find most interesting is when they insist that the character they voice is a gendered. That Mihoyo specifically told them this, not that it's their headcanon, or some fan fictitious idea they like. Just fact. I'm very sure the Chinese company said that, that Paimon is a gendered. We see so many cases like this now. Individuals that are simply hired to voice a dub for a script they're handed, yet they speak as if they hold authority over the work. They're not even the translators, but it's all the same. I don't find any of this acceptable. You can see other VAs near constantly using their social media in such a way to effectively attack fans. In the Western industry, this is normal. Meanwhile, Japanese VAs frequently act in the complete opposite direction. Going back to Redo of Healer, I follow both the male and female leads. When the show first premiered, the voice actress for Flair was on her social media, talking about how nervous she was giving her performance, thanking fans and even bringing attention to Western viewers as well for their support. She's constantly sharing art and all of her interactions with the fanbase have been positive. Obviously, there will be outliers on both sides of this, but the important takeaway here is just how normal it is for every facet of the Western industry to be at odds with the community, as well as propping up this behavior. Sadly, all of what we're discussing is not even contained to localized content anymore. Often, you can see Japanese media companies and creators attacked directly by cultish Westerners. Ridiculous stuff like complaining about Shonen Jump, Shonen as in literally meaning boys genre, is mainly appealing to, well, teenage boys as their target demographic. I could go forever naming examples of artists and mangaka harassed because of the content they create, but this video is long enough as it is. These are the people that will insist gatekeeping is bad, but for over half an hour now, I've shown you that's not what they really think. Like every other aspect of their performative nature, when talking about how they want to help the industry, that is a lie. They want anybody or anything who doesn't fit into the worldview out. That includes the content itself. Now, I do believe in gatekeeping. I'm not someone who will put on these performances to come off a way I'm not, but it's like this. I will accept anyone who's into a hobby, no matter their level of depth, opinions, basically anything. It's not like these people where I think it should be an exclusive club. It's open doors for anybody with genuine interest. However, these types that only seek to mold it into their own personal space, 
that's the people you don't want to feel welcome. Because while they might not be as transparent, that's what they want to do to you. So don't stand for this. In a lot of ways, the four kids localization style never went away. The specific demographic these properties were edited for just changed. When writing this video, there were moments when I looked at all of this and thought, what's even the point due to the scale of it all? But that's a really negative outlook, isn't it? I try to be positive when looking toward the future. And you know, the thing is, I'm sure you've noticed when going over examples, the most egregious cases took place around 2014 to 2018. Obviously, a lot of recent stuff is still awful, but what's gotten these things changed or pushed back is fans. We've gone over how Nintendo has acknowledged some issues. We've seen Seven Seas recall their novels and fix them. Even some Funimation releases got redubbed and resubbed for the Blu-rays. While it's not necessarily good that these changes became more sneaky, it shows that the more people talk about this, it can have an effect, and it can be pushed more and more out of the industry. Company perception and their bottom line is key, so keep in mind what you're supporting. I can't tell you what your own money should go to, but from my perspective, even if I were to believe supporting a company like Crunchyroll helped this industry, why would I want that? If they actually had some sway, this medium would change for the worse in a similar manner to the Sony situation. This is not a company concerned with my interest as a fan. I rather support other companies who will do their best to respect the products and use their funds appropriately, as well as importing merchandise to support the industry more directly. There's always options. Many of these people aren't the sole representatives of the industry or as important as they say they are. So I guess that's what I wanna leave you with. If this stuff bothers you, there's always something you can do even if it's as simple as having these conversations, because that's where everything starts. So that's the end of the video. As always, if you liked it, you can sub for more of my uh, random uploads, and you can find links down below to find me elsewhere, you know, Twitter and all that. But otherwise, I'll see you in the next video or stream, uh, wherever you go, <laughs> wherever you end up looking at me next. So yeah. <laughs>